Hello, Bible readers. By the end of the story about Israel making the golden calf, two things are clear. Israel violated the covenant, like the breaking of the commandment tablets was meant to show that the covenant was broken too. Israel is now alone in the world without God. It's like the covenant made at Sinai never happened. The other thing that's now clear, the second one, Moses' personal connection with God has grown stronger and tighter, like really strong, really tight. My last post showed how Moses is close enough to change God's mind. And Moses then gets as angry with Israel as God was. So they're united. Brueggemann calls this a triangle of relationships between God, Israel, and Moses. And as of this moment in the story, Israel's out, and Moses is well secured in. What follows in chapter 33 is a negotiation that explores what is and is not possible for each member of this triangle. For the first 11 verses of chapter 33, we hear that God will keep the promise to give Israel land, okay, but Israel will claim that land without God. They will go alone. Their future will be risky and exposed for sure. Moses, though, God treats Moses as a friend. And this dynamic is what sets up this amazing back and forth in verses 12 to 23. If you haven't read this already, chapter 30, 33, verses 12 to 23, now is the time to do that. Moses acts as chief negotiator for Israel. He doesn't have to, but he refuses to be treated apart from Israel. And there are six speeches then in this section, three from Moses, three from God, and they go back and forth. Moses goes first by quoting God back to God, which is always a good idea. Moses, this is the second time we've talked about this. Moses says, you said, God, bring this people up, this people. Consider too that this nation is your people. Basically, Moses is saying, this was a mixed multitude of nobodies when you heard their cry, and now you've created a nation out of them. So I'm not sure that you're free to walk away from they who are now Israel. To which God says, nothing about Israel at all. <laughs> Verse 14, God says, my presence will go with you, and I'll give you rest. God must be so angry. God doesn't even want to talk about Israel. Like, just don't go there. Moses responds to this by saying, If your presence will not go, will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way, we shall be distinct I and your people from every people on the face of the earth. Moses is so bold. God doesn't want to talk about Israel. God's willing to move on with just Moses, but Moses has this instinct about who God really is, about how God really works. Yes, God can be angry. Moses knows that. But Moses knows that God is not only one thing all the time, as we've spoken of in these posts many times. And more than angry, this God is love. The true God can be angry and is also love. This God is faithful to promises. And Moses is determined to explore that part of God even in this moment of anger. So God's response shows that Moses is right on. God says, I will do the very thing you've asked. Great. Mission accomplished. Negotiation over, right? Oh, no. Not at all. Moses has more that he wants. He makes a second request. He wants to see God's glory. Oh, does this lead into an amazing conversation. This is where Brueggemann offers another long consideration of what glory is. And as I was reading it a couple times today, I think God's glory the way I'm processing, processing it for myself is to think of it like the divine it. You know how some entertainers just have 
the mysterious it factor that grabs your attention for whatever reason more than most? Like, why does the camera just like some actors more than others? You know, Paul Newman, Tom Hanks, Harrison Ford, they just somehow invite everybody into the stories that they tell. Or athletes, some are said to have the mysterious it. Why do some athletes just find themselves making the biggest plays in the biggest moments of the biggest games? And for some of these athletes that have the it factor, oftentimes their stats don't really explain it, but everybody can see it. Everybody agrees they just somehow make the team better. Having it not only helps them win, but then it also creates a reputation, an aura, a legend about them. Moses wants to see God's it. Brueggemann says, Moses wants to penetrate the divine mystery and see what makes God's majesty tick. So God responds with the last of our six speeches, which includes our pivotal scripture verse for today in verse 19. God says, I will make all my goodness, which is an important word to notice. He's not, God doesn't say, I'll make all my glory pass before you. I will make all my goodness pass before you. And, and here's something very cool. I will proclaim before you the name. That's a name we usually translate Lord or God. We're not sure how that word is said. I usually say God when I see those four letters together. Y-H-W-H. Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So that's the, the pivotal moment in Scripture we're talking about today. And I need to let Brueggemann explain kind of what's happening here. God will not let Moses see God's face, which is the equivalent of God's glory, as requested. That would be apparently too dangerous for human vision. The face must remain hidden, but God makes a surprising concession to Moses. God's glory will pass by, but Moses must not look and must not see. But the divine concession is that as the glory... Or as the goodness passes by, as the glory passes by, Moses will get to see not the face, because that's too dangerous, but the rear end of God's glory. Not my words, Professor Brueggemann's. God wants to offer a generous response to Moses' request, but the response also needs to be appropriate. So goodness shall at least pass by, but no face looking you may see the tail end of God's glory. Want to hear an academic theologian joke? Brueggemann credits to Jacob Milgram. Brueggemann says, This concession about the divine rear end of glory caused Jacob Milgram in an address <clears throat> to refer jokingly to this narrative as a theophany. Theophany is when God encounters humans. Theophany. Get it? But that's not all God does in response to Moses' request. God will, and I mentioned this before, God will utter the divine name. This is amazing. When we take into account what God says to Moses when Moses first asked, way back in the third chapter of Exodus, who shall I say sent me? And God's like, I can't even really say, because my name is so holy that somehow if I, if I utter that name to you, you'll have this power that mm, I don't want you to have. This willingness to share the spoken name with Moses. That's what brings about today's pivotal verse. Because once God says, you know what, I'm going to say the name, God immediately follows that by saying, I will be gracious and merciful to whomever I want. It must be that saying that saying the divine name does grace and mercy. Like when I say this, grace and mercy just are gonna happen. Remember, God creates by speaking. Divine speech is what makes 
the universe happen. So speaking the divine name is grace-ing. It is mercy-ing. It's grace and mercy in action. And God's point is, I'll just do this whenever I want. I, I'll do grace, I'll do mercy whenever I want, with whomever I want. I am capable of self-giving, another way of talking about grace and mercy, and I am free to say my name if I want to say my name, to be gracious, to be merciful if I want to be, to free slaves if I want to, to accompany covenant breakers if I choose to. And we Christians would claim that this God will die on a cross if God wants to. It's all within God's freedom to act. God will not be compelled to act this way or that way. Could we have predicted that God would offer God's name to Moses? No. Did God have to give in to Moses' requests? Absolutely not. The point is God is free. And that pivotal point of scripture is a pretty gigantic big deal for us. Because that means, as Brueggemann says, God's freedom is a reminder that all our interpretive pretensions must stop short of certitude. So whenever some biblical scholar pretends to be certain, or whenever someone or a group of people are discerning God's opinion of a certain thing, a certain angle on an issue, remember how God said, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. We may want to be certain about a God who's very predictable and always does things this way, and but that's why this pivotal moment is called God's frustrating freedom. God will be God. The next post, God is full disclosure. Exodus 34, verses 6 to 7. I am one with my God. My God is with us, all of us at all times and in all places. 